Good morning and a welcome to the launch of the Global School and this session entitled Global Grand Challenges. My name is Jean King and I'm the Peterson Family Dean of the School of Arts and Sciences here at WPI. And today I'll be serving as your moderator for this panel. As a community, WPI has been at the forefront of exploring the complexities of the global grand challenges. As interconnected, interrelated, and interdependent wicked problems. Hence, the interdisciplinary faculty and team that we have gathered here today. To introduce the global grand challenges and WPI's approach to solving our planet's most urgent problems, please help me welcome our provost, VP, and Professor Wole Sobiesho. Wole? Thank you, Jean. Um, it's truly a pleasure for me to be uh, part of this session and to have the opportunity to introduce our Global Grand Challenges approach at WPI. Um, as, as we all know, as I said in my earlier remarks, um, one of the greatest opportunities we have, I think, as a community is to, to really tackle global grand challenges as a theme. And this builds, of course, on our approach of theory and practice that is inherent to us, but connects to the aspiration of the global school of this great ideal of impact. Next. And so what we wanna do is to leverage our history through four industrial revolutions with the technologies and solutions that we bring and can take to the world. Next, please. And as we think about this, uh, we, wanna we wanna ask some questions. What are the big grand challenges? And of course, the National Academy of Engineering and others have identified a number of big grand challenges. And so those are the big questions that Gene talked about. And then as we as teams come together, we wanna ask what are the demand-driven group activities that we can come together around that can drive the development of local global solutions with impact that we want. And, and so we wanna do this, of course, through research, education, and partnerships in a way that allows us to collect the impact from the different activities that we have through our teams in a way that will allow us as a WPI global community uh, to, to have an impact that's measurable and an impact that affects people's lives and the environment. Next. So thinking about this, um, it's interesting to, to then say, okay, what are the areas where we as a community have organic teams uh, where we can really have some well-posed questions? And so we, we've worked with the WPI community to identify four of these in terms of areas where we have groups of people uh, that are doing work from ideas to research projects, policy impact on community. And these include folks that are working in global grand challenges related to water, food and health, energy, climate change adaptability. Now, those groups, of course, have people from multiple disciplines. We also have communities of folks that are using the outcomes from those efforts to drive WPI's efforts in outcomes related efforts related to sustainability, circular economy, global public safety, development, and the future of work and the work. And so in today's session, what we're going to do is we're going to have representatives from each of these areas talk about the group efforts that are going on within WPI and beyond WPI to develop strategic collaborations in which we hope to have impact that is measurable. And that measurable impact could be impact that drives, for example, sustainable development goals. It could be impact that drives the future of work in an era of AI, machine learning and robotics, and in particular, the future of the worker. It could be impact that drives great public goods such as global public safety, 
and it could be impact that drives this whole notion of a circular economy, which is a world in which there is no waste. And it could of course determine how we live and interact with our environment through our sustainability initiatives. Next, please. And so for this session, um, it is really a pleasure for me to introduce this team in this session, which Jean will manage. That includes folks that are working and leading teams of people that are thinking about what are the big grand challenge problems in health, in health during the pandemic, in climate change adaptation, in water and energy. And so Chris Wolby will talk about health grand challenges and heal the world. Dimitri Korkin will present some of the work we've been doing in the pandemic. Sarah Strauss will talk about climate change adaptation. Hal Walker about water and Mike Timko about the energy group. And then in terms of the emerging co-created solutions, Paul Matheson will present some of those in sustainability. Joe Sarkis will talk about the circular economy. Jian Yu Liang will talk about global public safety and the center that she co-directs. And Rob Kruger will talk about instead the Institute for Science and Technology for Development and the development thrust and the opportunity for us to make a major impact in this area. And Martin Burt will talk about the future of work and the future of the worker and how we as a WPI community can really do work that goes well beyond our boundaries to really impact groups such as the World Economic Forum and other global groups that can benefit from the kind of STEM-based work that we offer. So it promises to be an exciting session and I look forward uh, to really all the presentations and the discussions uh, that will be led by our own Dean of Arts and Sciences, Jean King. Okay, thanks very much, Jean. So with that, I'd like to introduce uh, Chris Wolby, who will talk about uh, grand challenges thinking from the start. <clears throat> Chris. Good morning again, everybody. I think it's particularly appropriate that I get to head off the, um, the grand challenges presentations um, because I'm gonna be talking about how WPI inculcates grand challenges thinking from the very beginning by asking student or giving out students the opportunity to participate in our Great Problem Seminars program. Next. And I'll be using Heal the World as our example. So um, each of the Great Problem Seminars has at its heart one of the world's big complex problems. Um, for example, global health issues. And the advantages to that kind of a framing is that these problems that are so important and so relevant to the students gives them real motivation to dig in and work on, on the, the coursework. Um, and so there's a real intrinsic motivation built in. Because the great problems of the world are um, not going to be solved by any particular disciplinary approach, all of these courses are team taught and the Heal the World has the benefit of having two excellent faculty in Professor Rao from Biology and Biotechnology and Professor Stoddard from the Global School and in affiliation with the Social Science and Policy Studies. So they get those two perspectives, but because that's not enough, um, they all, those two faculty also work to provide the students with a variety of other perspectives on the problem of global health so that the system students can really look at it from more of a systems approach. In the beginning of the course, this faculty present the students with exercises that ask them to not only develop content knowledge, but to develop really important professional skills. So for example, one of the um, projects that the students work on in the beginning of the class is they are given a particular community and they have to evaluate that community from a variety of perspectives, but also focusing on what they have in, uh, in place for healthcare assets. And then to think about what would happen to that community in the face of some climate disaster, say maybe forest fires or hurricanes and see how, that, how resilient that community would be faced with such a disaster. Another example, while they are looking at various health technologies that are used to combat global health issues, 
they're asked to think about how discrimination might be exacerbated or alleviated by use of that particular technology. Once the students have the, uh, a foundational knowledge of the problems and a variety of perspectives from which to analyze it, they are, um, next slide, asked to divide into teams and to pick one particular instance of a global health problem. And here is an example from last year's class where a student team decided to address the issue of multidrug resistant bacteria. And in their project, which they conducted the last half of the class or the last seven weeks, um, these students decided to compare two different treatments um, for multidrug resistant bacteria. One would be silver nanoparticles and the other would be to treat with bacteriophage. And for those of you who don't know, bacteriophage are viruses that infect and kill um, sometimes bacteria. So they evaluated those two and decided that phage would be a better treatment from a variety of perspectives. And then they looked at what it would take to implement phage as a therapy for multidrug resistant bacteria. This is presented um, as was alluded to earlier by Kent in a giant uh, public presentation, which uh, the students find very daunting, but also very empowering. And you can imagine that students who complete a project of this magnitude and this complexity are really well prepared then to go on and work with faculty who are working on some of the global grand challenges in the health world. Next slide. What we have here depicted is a few of those labs that are engaged in um, approaches to health issues. And I wanna highlight that this is just a few, there are many more on campus, um, but for example, um, students can continue working on, on drug resistant bacteria by um, continuing their work with Professor Rao in her lab. Godet's lab is working on artificial hearts, among other things. They can, if they've got a robotics bent, um, you can detect cancer with robots in the Zhang lab or work toward curing malaria with Professor Weathers. There are a number of digital health initiatives, one around sleep that's run by um, Professor Ruiz, and there are other um, digital health issues that Benga Situlu in her lab works on. And so that is um, a lovely on-ramp for our students to get involved in these grand challenge health issues. And I'll turn it over now to Professor Dimitri Korkin, um, who will talk to you about work ongoing on the pandemic. Thank you very much, uh, Chris. Um, so uh, speaking of global health issues, it is impossible not to talk about the current global, uh, global health crisis, which is the COVID-19 pandemic. Next slide, please. So to show the impact of COVID-19, I could cite tens of you know, papers uh, showing tens of millions infected and over millions of deaths. But the statistics that perhaps best reflects the global magnitude of this pandemic is the fact that the population in every single country currently is affected by this virus. Next slide. So how does WPI tackle this health problem? Well, we are at the forefront of the fight against this virus, both globally and local community-wise. Our scientists, including my group, have done pioneering work in understanding the molecular components of the virus, the key molecular mechanisms behind the infection, and how the virus spreads, with the goal to provide medical researchers and clinicians the insights to the new treatments and develop strategies and protocols to minimize the viral spread. And our engineers develop new designs of oxygen ventilators and sensors to advance the patient treatment and recovery. Next slide, please. And overall, our response to the global, this global crisis goes way beyond the research. In the late spring, we have worked together with the doctors, clinicians, and educators in Africa 
who are facing at the times the first late wave of the pandemic. We shared our most recent knowledge about the virus, the pandemic and our solutions to treatment and minimizing the impact of the infection. We have also developed a transparent data-driven technology to share with our students and with the entire world uh, the current st health status on campus that is based on over 30,000 tests done in the past 30 days. So altogether, by advancing research, providing education to communities and nations, as well as sharing important data with WPI members and with the rest of the world, our institution provides an important contribution towards the global fight against the current pandemic and will be well equipped and prepared should any future pandemic occur. Thank you. And uh, we're gonna continue with the, uh, another important global grand challenge, uh, the, the challenge of the climate change uh, presented by Sarah Strauss. Hi all, thank you, Dimitri. I'm Sarah Strauss, Professor of Anthropology in the Global School. The COVID-19 the COVID pandemic continues to be an enormous challenge for the entire planet. But with this challenge has come unprecedented opportunity to see the world differently, to reimagine our future, and to think about how our lives and livelihoods are part of a vast and interconnected system with both problems and solutions that can resonate and resolve in sometimes surprising ways. The lessons that we have learned from COVID, how to pivot quickly, make choices that benefit the whole, and think synergistically about health, environment, and economy can also help us to address climate change among the most wicked of our wicked problems. We know that extensive use of fossil fuels as well as shifts in land use and land cover changes have led to the accumulation of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, resulting in global warming. Though climate change sometimes manifests as a unique and primary transformation, like the melting of permafrost in the Arctic, it's more often an intensifier of the problems that we already experience in communities around the world. We see bigger storms, longer droughts, more erosion, more intense fires, and all the rest that you have seen this year. We see problems that we need to address. So I want to talk now about how WPI's educational approach supports research for addressing community impacts from these grand challenges and specifically to talk about climate change. While the changing climate affects the entire planet, adaptation to such changes must be managed locally. As was the case in the new field of public health in the mid 19th century, we now need to train a new set of professionals who can help communities adapt to the conditions they are experiencing under a changing climate, a kind of planetary health profession, if you will. That is why we are proposing a new graduate program for the Global School, a master's degree in community climate adaptation jointly managed by the Departments of Integrative and Global Studies and Civil and Environmental Engineering. Slide. Um, to do that, we will deploy WPI's signature project-based learning approach, working in interdisciplinary teams with sponsors around the world to help people build capacity and develop strategies for coping with global environmental change. The program will use a systems approach to train students to collaborate with communities and will also provide a framework that our faculty can use for comparative and longitudinal data collection for their ongoing research to mutual benefit. To do this successfully, we must think hard about questions as what it means to live a good life under carbon constrained conditions, as well as how we should manage water resources ethically and responsibly, both in the case of too much water in storms or floods or too little in droughts or seasonal shifts or having the wrong kind of water in the wrong place as with saltwater incursion in coastal and island areas. We must work collaboratively to examine the intersections between global patterns and climate and ways that we have moved goods and deploy services in urban and rural, urban and rural contexts, seeking more circular and less linear patterns of supply chains, and we need, must, we need to especially be aware of the similarities and differences across landscapes, cultures, and communities, depending on her historical circumstances and modern day choices. We can either support the development of richly diverse and sustainable livelihoods or propagate inequalities that worsen outcomes. So last week, we launched the first seminar in our new speaker series for the Global School entitled Collaboration for a Better World. That title reinforces our values and intent for the Global School. 
The first speaker, Jenny Stevens from Northeastern University, discussed her new book, Diversifying Power, which highlights how increasing diversity can reduce the impacts of climate change, improve health, and lead to a more democratic energy transition. Here at WPI, slide please, our faculty have been working on a number of climate related problems that affect local communities, from analysis of geographic distribution of heat islands in Worcester, Massachusetts, to water resources in the Swiss Alps, as well as climate stories in India. Here we see two of Ingrid Shockey's recent IQP teams interviewing folks in the Himalayan communities near our partner IIT Mundi to talk about their experiences of climate change. The Instagram feed you see on the right was produced from interviews conducted by one of the teams telling these climate stories. The urban heat island investigation, next slide please, on the left is based in Worcester and directly concerns environmental justice mapped here geographically. It is one of several regional projects initiated by Seth Tuller, this one with Steve McCauley, that allows people to discuss options for mitigation of environmental problems using a method that engages them in dialogue about the challenges they face, integrates local knowledge and experience with scientific data collected by the researchers, and supports strategic planning to mitigate future impacts. On the right-hand side of the slide, you can see a range of maps from the 18th to the 20th centuries, showing glaciers and other water resources from the Swiss Alpine village of Leukerbad, where I have conducted fieldwork on climate, water, and health since the 1990s. These projects are but a small snapshot of the kinds of work that our WPI faculty are doing to address climate concerns in the context of food, energy, and water systems. All of these projects provide insights into the ways that local communities experience climate change over time and in local spaces, engaging students and faculty to collaborate in addressing global grand challenges. Thank you. And now we turn to Professor Joe Sarkis to talk about the circular economy. Thank you, Professor Strauss. I will talk about the circular economy as a solution and a challenge. A circular economy has existed since early civilization. It is now being revisited in modern society as both a technical and social innovation. WPI is positioned for global leadership to help integrate and grow the circular economy as a modern innovation. As we can see in both these models, there is circularity in how we produce and consume products, materials, and resources extending the life of products and materials. We have to be stewards of these resources since they are finite. This is why the circular economy has returned as an important innovation for managing in a sustainable society and world, and it is a global challenge. Next slide, please. To manage and optimize the circular economy, as well as to make social innovation possible, a transdisciplinary and inclusive approach is required. A transdisciplinary effort means that we have to work together across disciplines and across sectors to be able to solve some of the wicked problems that the circular economy challenges throw, throws at society. As you can see in this model, transdisciplinarity includes the basic natural resources and engineering sciences, working with social and management sciences, as well as arts and humanities to be able to address basic scholarly needs. But we also have to think about the practicalities involved, which means that transdisciplinarity requires that we go outside the scholarly and academic community to collaborate with societal and industrial stakeholders. WPI is poised to be able to do this and has already started these efforts. WPI's model after all is theory and practice. CE crosses, circular economy crosses many other global challenges as well water, food, energy, and materials are each part of resources that require management and the circular economy can support these challenges. Next slide, please. WPI offer efforts are also global and here are some of them. For example, we have provided a venue for scholars from throughout the world to communicate their interests and needs and expertise to a circular economy. This example I show here is something that we did last May. If you notice, WPI is central to the sponsorship, including cooperation with other international sustainability and sustainable consumption and production organizations. This open forum attracted over 300 participants from over 50 countries and exemplifies the international reach that WPI has. The idea is grand challenges need to include a variety of very difficult problems to solve and the circular economy is not just a technical solution, but a social solution that requires consideration of equitable, inclusive, and environmentally sound societal 
and industrial practices. Next slide, please. As I have mentioned, WPI is also a leader and pioneer from a number of perspectives related to the circular economy. For example, we offer to follow the National Science Foundation to investigate a world without waste, a core underpinning of the circular economy. What you see here is the end of a video submitted by Mike Timko to the NSF Big Ideas Contest titled A World Without Waste. Since that time, the NSF has put calls for research around this topic and WPI was a major contributor to this research theme. I also wanna to bring to your attention the CEDARS program here at WPI. It is a recently funded NSF research training grant that was received by F, uh, WPI. CEDAR stands for Circular Economy Data Analysis and Engineering Research and Sciences. It involves multiple disciplines, disciplines and is built on a transdisciplinary relationship that includes industry and external st stakeholders to train PhD students to lead the world and the future. Next slide, please. Another initiative at the local level occurred in May 2019 around the Research and Discovery and Innovation Symposium, whose central themes included the circular economy. What I show here is a picture of Duran Apellian, whose research includes materials and metals recycling through one of our research centers, which is central to the circular economy principle. Ironically, when we held this local symposium, Duran had to make a video because he was in Europe with his research team at a workshop we spon they sponsored on the circular economy. This is another example of local action at WTPI that has global results and outreach. We are also a global leader in sustainable supply chains, which is a core operational aspect of the circular economy. Our research in this area is some of the most cited in the world. What I have described here is just a small slice of a very large WPI pie. There are many more activities, more research, education, and outreach at many levels related to the circular economy and its principles. I believe we are poised to maintain and build a true circular economy with WPI leading this effort at a global level. And now to speak next after me is Professor Walker, who will speak about water grand challenges. Thank you, Joe, for uh, the introduction. As Joe mentioned, I'm Hal Walker, and uh, I'm from the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering here at WPI. And I'm going to uh, present WPI's efforts uh, in tackling the global water grand challenge. Uh, to start, I'd just like to illustrate the magnitude of this problem. Um, to be sure, the need for safe water is immense, and uh, I'm sure you're aware a, dare, a day rarely goes by without water being in the news. Uh, according to the United Nations, close to 1 billion people lack access to safe drinking water, and around 2 billion lack access to basic sanitation. While the COVID pandemic has been truly devastating, uh, with now over 1 million deaths, as Dimitri noted, the United Nations also reports that over 1.5 million children die every year due to diarrhea, which is closely related, uh, is closely tied to the availability of clean water. In addition to clean water, we also face significant issues and challenges related to water scarcity. While many locations across the globe have sufficient water, many, many others do not. So the global water grant challenge is not only immense, but it's also complex. As the quote on the slide notes here, the global uh, water crisis is connected to bigger issues of poverty, power, and social inequality that some of the other speakers have, have noted. As such, the technological fixes uh, that we might come up with will likely not be effective unless broader measures are also taken at the same time to address these bigger issues. Next slide, please. Here at WPI, we aim to tackle the Global Water Grant Challenge through the collaboration of our faculty, students, and perhaps most importantly, our global partners. In fact, WPI already has a core strength in the development of new and innovative water treatment technologies and, sen and sensors as highlighted in this figure. And uh, around the oval of this figure, some of the people here at WPI and some of the exciting things that they're doing uh, on these fronts. Uh, professors Farney and Duddle, for example, have developed new ways to detect lead and lead corrosion in water distribution systems. Myself and Professor Bergendahl have been looking at developing advanced oxidation processes for removing organic contaminants from drinking water. 
Professor Matheson is active in developing new wastewater systems for sustainable water management. And Professor Timko, who you're gonna hear from next, is exploring new ways to extract energy from wastewater. I'd like to highlight that this is just a snapshot of just a few of the faculty efforts focused on water here at WPI. There are many, many more I don't have time to cover. I'd also like to highlight that the launch of the Global School is particularly exciting because it provides a platform to integrate knowledge across disciplines, as was mentioned earlier. Integrating these new technological developments I just discussed with policy, social sciences, economics, and other fields to hopefully truly bring about long lasting solutions. Again, as hi highlighted by this figure. Uh, next slide, please. To make this vision a reality uh, and to try to take our impact to the next level, we're focusing on three main activities, catalyzing innovation, sharing knowledge, and establishing partnerships. Now, all three of these activities are designed to enhance collaborative opportunities across campus, across disciplines and across the world. Our goal is to foster and create an innovative ecosystem to, dev to develop new solutions to the global water crisis. And one of the most important components of this approach is the last item on this list, our project centers, which I'll discuss in more detail on the next slide. Next slide, please. As the provost and others mentioned earlier, the WPI project centers provide a really unique opportunity to make a significant impact on grand challenges in general, and I'll argue the global water crisis in particular. In fact, there's already a lot of activities focused around water at the 50 plus project centers around the world. Professors Doran and Bergendahl, for example, recently initiated uh, a number of water projects at the new United Arab Emirates Project Center. We've also had water projects as far away as South Africa and, and closer to home here in Massachusetts. This is a great start, but we also have significant room to expand our activities related to water at the various project centers, which is also exciting. The project centers are really key to our efforts to tackle the global water crisis because they enable us to integrate knowledge across multiple perspectives, geographies, and scales. The multiple project centers across the globe also allow us to synthesize results and solutions to develop an understanding that goes beyond what we learn at individual locations. This is truly unique. Few if any educational institutions have this capability. So with that, I wanna thank you for the opportunity to present WPI's efforts and plans in tackling the global water crisis. We have a strong foundation to build on and the launch of the Global School, I think, will just provide the environment we need to greatly expand our efforts and impact in this area. So with that, I'll hand it over to Professor Mike Timko from the Department of Chemical Engineering, who's gonna discuss WPI's efforts in the area of energy. All right, thank you so much, Professor Walker. Uh, we can advance the slide, please. Um, so I'm happy to talk today about uh, energy. And as other speakers have said, uh, there's really a lot of activity going on in this area at WPI. And so I'm only gonna be able to highlight some aspects of it. Um, what we have here is a way of thinking about the different activities that uh, are going on at WPI, but at even a more um, high level than this, we can say that uh, the group has been very active, strong, and made really good contributions both at WPI and beyond. Um, and so that includes, for example, bringing in new instrumentation, bringing in unique opportunities for our undergraduates uh, to be trained in research, and then most recently uh, contributing to the uh, graduate research training grant called CEDARS that Professor Sarkis mentioned. In just the last five years, five of our faculty have won prestigious NSF career awards. Uh, and so we're hoping to continue to grow and build on, uh, on these successes. So how we think of our work, um, energy of course is uh, something that touches on many different aspects of our lives. But here I'm talking primarily about transportation. And so we can see that um, traditionally all of our uh, energy, uh, most of our energy at least for the past 100 years have been derived from fossil resources, natural gas, coal, petroleum. And that still continues. But what we are seeing more and more is a transition 
to more sustainable and greener alternatives and renewable alternatives. And those include things like waste or wastewater, as uh, Professor Walker mentioned earlier, algae, biomass, and solar power. And we have faculty involved in all of these areas. Uh, my main area, along with Professor uh, Andrew Texera in chemical engineering, is sort of in that middle area there in terms of food waste and biomass, and then doing biorefining to get to fuels that we can use for transportation. Um, the bottom part is an area that Professor uh, Lubatidova, Professor Pratap Rao, Professor Aaron Deskins in physics, mechanical engineering, and chemical engineering are all active in, in terms of harnessing um, solar power for, uh, for instance, uh, energy, but also for reactions to make hydrogen. Professor Yan Wong has been involved very heavily uh, in storing that energy, uh, as shown in the bottom right. And people in civil engineering uh, have been involved with trying to understand how to use that energy more uh, sustainably in terms of using uh, more uh, environmentally and energetically efficient housing. Um, and then the last step of all this, to bring it back to the circular point that Professor Sarkis was mentioning, mentioning, is we could either imagine using the CO2 that is generated, the carbon dioxide that's generated by combustion to, for example, grow more algae or biomass or food, or we can capture it, which is another area of interest at WPI. If we can capture it, then we can make true carbon negative technologies, which are one uh, alternative or one option for averting the climate problems that Professor Strauss was mentioning. So the next slide, please. So one aspect of this that goes global is uh, WPI's partnership with the Brazilian University Unicampi, which is uh, located in Campinas, Brazil. And here we're just showing where that's located and some photographs, aerial photographs of the university. We've had a number of students, eight total in the last two years visit uh, and done really wonderful projects, including um, winning uh, second place in departmental contests for, uh, both years actually um, for MQP of the year. If you can advance one more time, please. And then just to give you a flavor of what uh, we're, we're thinking about in this uh, collaboration, the idea is to take the abundant agricultural materials and especially the waste materials that are present and are, are easily grow, grown in locations like Brazil and then bring those down into different products that can be used as replacements to petroleum derived fuels, chemicals and materials. And this is just an infographic from a review paper that we published with that uh, under this collaboration in the last year. So that's just a flavor of what we do. Of course, it's uh, somewhat idiosyncratic and there's a lot more to continue to divide, dive into. But I'd like to turn it over now to uh, Professor Paul Matheson, who's going to talk about sustainability. Thank you, Mike. Um, so uh, we've heard about a number of uh, um, of the areas that are, are certainly relevant uh, for our grand challenges and some of the accomplishments here. Um, I'm gonna be speaking a little bit more broadly um, uh, to speak about the, uh, the needs of current and uh, future generations and some of the initiatives related to sustainability that we have here. My name is Paul Matheson. I'm the Director of Sustainability here at WPI. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so um, for our sustainability in initiatives, I wanna sp spend a little time talking about our, uh, what we call our sustainability ecosystem as an example. Um, this ecosystem really is founded on three pillars or uh, foundational principles, which really involve economic security, environmental stewardship, and social justice, which we recognize are very uh, um, well are critical aspects of uh, all those are critical for sustainability. Uh, our programs uh, and our educational programs and our research are really um, developed around these core values. In addition to that, you know, from a sustain sustainability perspective, uh, we generally develop goals in four different areas. These include academics and educational programs, research and scholarship, uh, community engagement, um, as well as operations and facilities here at WPI. The initiatives are kind of broken down into two major areas. Um, on one aspect of it, we look more locally um, and consider um, our campus and the local area as a living and learning laboratory to support sustainability. Um, there are a lot of initiatives here right on campus, including the research that's been talked about already, already and uh, which really supports sustainability and provides a good foundation for it to develop innovative approaches. 
we can expand upon these and apply these towards a, a global perspective on things. And this is what's exciting about the global school because it gives us those opportunities to really try to develop a global impact. And you've heard a lot about this, the different approaches here. By thinking about it in an integrated sense, we can develop a, uh, use a systems approach um, and, and include cross-disciplinary integrated approaches to really develop a, a broader perspective that includes a, a variety of different people uh, to get involved in that. Next slide, please. As an example, the food, water, and energy area is shown here. Um, just to comment quickly, you know, here at WPI, we're concerned about, you know, try, trying to conserve our water, recognizing that even the New England area has major issues involving drought. Um, the city of Worcester trying to support them for the water quality, for instance, as well. Um, and would be, and I'll look at other areas involved in the uh, sustainability initiatives related to, uh, to Worcester. Um, globally, if we look at that, you know, well, certainly there's project centers also that have been developed really that include Paraguay, for instance, and there's so many food, water, energy issues related there. Martin is here today, maybe he's might expand upon some of these as well. Um, and then maybe with many different types of water issues as well. Um, all these involve food, water, and energy, and then we can even look at some of the um, new innovative technologies to develop these things. If you look at these things, we really develop innovation um, and conservation and technology management, um, you know, through our, our local efforts, through the efforts that we have going in here. And we link a lot of these together when we look at our circular economy approaches and our systems of planning approaches that so many of our colleagues bring to it. Next slide, please. Now, I just wanna talk about a few examples of our local project centers and the work here. And so think about maybe how these apply globally. We're hearing a lot of other opportunities for global work. We've done a lot of stuff in Worcester. You've heard about that. There are concerns regarding the examples of climate change. Um, I'm gonna go specifically, actually just give an example to talk about Chelsea, Massachusetts, which is in the Boston area. If we can go right to the next slide, please, that would be great. Um, and so for Chelsea, basically it's a low lying community right um, in, the, uh, um, in the Boston area, right adjacent to the shore in the Mystic River. And um, there's a, a broad, um, very diverse community. Um, and you know, there's certainly huge impacts related to uh, climate change. Um, for instance, if you go to the next slide, um, the first thing that we note is that, you know, in this region, there's a really many environmental justice communities. This is just shown generally here, but what you can see is broadly the environmental justice is really shown in green. If again, and then in addition to that, what I'd add is that if you saw the, the slide that just kind of popped in there uh, for the, uh, um, the water, uh, basically uh, coming in play next, onto the next slide now and I'll show you. Um, there you go. So this is an example of a 1% of, of annual chance of flooding um, and what the potential implications for Chelsea are. This has implications regarding the transportation. It has regarding for, for food for your energy significantly, and in terms of actually for food in particular, because there's a major processing centers right in this location. So it really has important impacts that involve different aspects of, uh, of sustainability and really involve different aspects of, of people from different perspectives bringing it into place. Uh, if we can go on to the next slide. So I guess what I'm excited about with the Global School is that it really gives us an opportunity to collaborate, work together, which is an important part of it. We wanna advance our sustainability planning efforts here, you know, try to evaluate how we're doing, develop a living and learning laboratory, both here right on WPI and locally. Um, and then we also really wanna coordinate with our partners both here and, and globally. We wanna establish locally, regionally and global partners. Um, we wanna use those partnerships to uh, really help meet society's sustainability challenges and really have an impact. Um, so, um, and speaking to some of the partners, our next speaker, I'll pass it on there, but um, our next speaker will be uh, um, Jianyu Ling, who will be talking about the Center for uh, Public Global Safety. Thank you, Professor Messerson. Uh, I'm Professor Jianyu Liang. Uh, I'm one of the co-directors of WPI's uh, Center for Global Public Safety. Uh, since 2016, with the support of our friends and the partners, our Center for Public uh, Global Safety has worked on many fronts such as fire protection, water security, public health, food security, energy innovation, and transportation. The center was originally established by WPI and our academic partner Tsinghua University in Beijing, China. Now the center's uh, footprints have expanded to Middle East, Europe, and Africa. Next, please. Uh, Tsinghua University is the funding, uh, funding academic partner. Um, we have consistently worked on uh, strengthening our partnership and growing our collaboration to provide new opportunities for research and education. 
last September, prof uh, our president election visited the Tsinghua University, and the two universities officially established an exchange program for our undergraduate and our graduate students. In 2019, Tsinghua University invited the WPI to share our vision on higher education at the Boal Forum for Asia, alongside with the University of Oxford, Eco uh, Polytechnic, Coventry University, and Yunsan University. Our provost represented the WPI at this high-level forum. So our center also seeks to establish a carefully selected partnership with other universities. One new project center has recently been established in UAE in collaboration with the American University of Sharjah. We also host an annual symposium in the fall and an industry forum in the spring. At this event, our partners, supporters, and friends provide feedback to our center and we discuss research needs and future directions together. Next slide, please. So since the establishment of the center, uh, we worked very hard to offer many student uh, global project opportunities with support uh, of our partner universities, multinational companies, high tech startup companies and the local organizations. For example, in 2019, a team of students worked with Too Simple, the leader in autonomous uh, truck development, uh, to develop a sub mainframe to collect and preserve the data from devices installed on the trucks and transfer the data to the cloud via the internet for subsequent data uh, processing. Another team of our students worked with Siemens China to develop a new building automation system. The team proposed a new Internet of the Things based building architecture system that utilizes cloud computing and artificial intelligence. Next slide, please. We also uh, launched a new journal of safety science and resilience for communicating and documenting important progress the research community makes in this important field. Currently, we're working on a special issue on prevention and control of the COVID-19. Next slide, please. The center, uh, our center finds the faculty exchange between WPI and the Tsinghua University. We hope to uh, continue our effort and being able to expand this funded faculty exchange experience to all the partners. In the meantime, the center also supports interdisciplinary research teams by providing seed grants. Two examples of our research funded research efforts are the uh, swarms of the autonomous robots for the situ situational awareness in firefighting and uh, building a better biosensor for uh, lead uh, detection in the drinking water. We look forward to continue and expand our efforts to support and develop exciting new opportunities for research and education with all our global partners. So next, I uh, will turn uh, this over to Professor Rob Kruger, the head of our Department of Social Science and the Policy Studies. Thanks, Jian Yu, uh, for that introduction. I appreciate it. Um, welcome, everyone. Uh, it's my great pleasure to be here to talk to you about the role of INSTEAD and, uh, and how we address the development grand challenge um, through generative justice. Development provides an operating system, uh, a systemic approach, really, for addressing grand challenges such as climate, poverty, health, the environment, energy, the circular economy, and the future of work, because it works at the nexus of science, innovation, and culture. Next slide, please. One thing that we have to remember is development is not something that we go to the global south to do. It's something that's required everywhere, whether it's sub-Saharan Africa, the Ruhrgebiet in Germany, or right in our own main south neighborhood in Worcester. But the problem with development is, and continues to be, uh, it's met with well-deserved skepticism because it has tended to focus on technological fixes to, for social problems without respecting the culture and innovative capacity of the planned beneficiary. 
um, this word salad represents some of the ideas that come out of what conventional development has produced. Next slide, please. So represented here, um, I, it's, a, it's a wordy slide, but I'd just like you to look at the, the large words in red because this is how we engage in our own forms of uh, generative justice. Um, it's through inclusion, co-design, co-creation, recognizing partners as not people with problems and the inability to solve them, but as partnerships with assets. It's also a socio-cultural process. So we define generative justice as a universal right to create value that circulates through meaningful peer-to-peer -peer collaborative exchanges within a group, community, or society. Beyond problem solving, the partners have the right and the capacity to nurture their own self-sustaining pathways. Next slide, please. Um, this is, uh, these images are from, uh, are putting our ideas around uh, development and uh, generative justice into practice. Um, this image on the left is an IQP team working with uh, the community of Achem Janasi in the Eastern region of Ghana. Um, and they're working together to build a bridge. And this is truly a co-designed, co-produced process that uh, empowers both our students in that they recognize um, that they are not the experts that arrive with a certain level of hubris to solve people's problems for them, but they arrive with humility to work together with the community. Um, this bridge uh, was truly co-designed in the sense that um, uh, uh, if you talk to the students, it's, we included cement uh, so as to uh, avoid at the locals recommendation to uh, avoid termite infestation and, and rot from water. This image on the right um, is uh, a group of MQP students who won the Provost MQP award last year, um, who worked with um, the man uh, who's on the right, the second on the right, um, Bismarck, to design a retort. Uh, artisanal, artisanal and small scale miners in uh, all across uh, Central Africa um, work to, uh, uh, har uh, sorry, uh, create gold from ore uh, using mercury, which exposes them, their families and their communities uh, to mercury poisoning or to, to mercury and, and uh, mercury poisoning. With the, the help of Bismarck and his colleagues, we designed a retort that allows the um, uh, mercury vapor to uh, uh, liquefy again and so it can be recycled, thus protecting um, the miners and their families from the deleterious effects from mercury exposure. Next slide, please. So who is instead? On WPI's campus, it represents 50 scholars, researchers, educators, and students, uh, some of which you can see in the background there. Um, we have a number of partners from across the world uh, including the Pre President's Office of S Sustainable Development in Ghana, the National University of Science and Technology in, in Zimbabwe, uh, the Global Sustainable Development Project, which operates uh, in Ghana, Kenya, and Ethiopia. We have private sector partners, such as Crew Technologies, Amps Electric, and Intel, um, and as well as our own Assistance Foundation, uh, who, who are working with us to bring math and science um, uh, uh, improvements in um, Sub-Saharan Africa at the moment. Next slide, please. So science and innovation at the, at the Global Polytechnic. We are establishing a new canon of knowledge around how generative justice and development uh, could happen. We have two books in the, in the process, one that's been accepted by MIT Press, another one by the American Institutes of Physics. We have special issues of two journals that are in process. We're working, uh, like I said, with the Assistance Foundation uh, to bring it at, as an as a educational tool to Sub-Saharan Africa. And we recently received a grant from the Intel Corporation to study e-waste reduction and recovery in Sub-Saharan Africa, in Ghana and Zimbabwe in particular. We have a new BS uh, sorry, a new master's of science degree, a BAMS degree, BS, 
BA, MS degree, and a minor in science and technology for innovation and global development. And we're also working with strategic partners, including Engineers Without Borders, to develop accessible, affordable uh, ways for people to um, generate their own solutions to problems uh, that can help influence uh, them the future, and the future of work and their edu educational goals. Speaking of the future of work, I'd like to now turn this over to uh, Martine Burt, um, who will talk about the future of work. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Rob. Hello, everybody. Um, I'm very happy to be participating in this in this uh, program. And as Rob mentioned, the um, the future of work is a is a wicked problem because not only do we have the fourth revol in industrial revolution, but we also have COVID nineteen. So it's the the perfect storm practically. And uh, even the World Economic Forum right now is talking about a great reset that is due uh, with um, stakeholder capitalism and with a big focus on uh, sustainability. So what we have also at WPI is a value proposition that we promise our graduates that upon graduation, they will, our students upon graduation, they will earn well as scientists or succeed in business. So. How do we prepare our students for the future of work? Because our students now, um, not only uh, they want purpose, not only fill their refrigerator, but also feed their soul. Next. So one, uh, one question that we can ask is, what if the problem is not the future of work, but the worker? And if it is such, how can we uh, ask workers for their perspectives on their problems. And this is something that uh, my teams and I are working on developing um, methodologies to consult with the poorest of with them and I always said, and also um, helping workers learn skills to remain relevant in the workforce. Next. So uh, an area in which I work uh, both uh, in Latin America and Africa and Asia, Oceania and uh, Europe and the US is social entrepreneurship. And this is a perfect field for uh, WPI uh, faculty, staff, and students, basically identifying a difficult problem causing suffering to people or planet, finding the opportunity in the problem, and using innovation and entrepreneurship to find a solution that is scalable, sustainable, and permanent. And this coincides with our values at WPI that were mentioned today, sustainability, innovation, entrepreneurship, value creation, project-based learning, design thinking, and uh, maker culture with benefits both for um, faculty incentives for research and for students to seeing how they can pay their student loans and seeing their return on investment. Next. Last year, um, as part of our program of attracting social entrepreneurs to visit campus, we brought a social entrepreneur who founded TerraCycle that is basically using waste um, for um, uh, other purposes. And um, what he mentioned, what Tom Zakey mentioned was that uh, there's a paradox right now with a declining recycling industry now that China is no longer importing waste as it used to with an increased uh, consumer care. And he found and shared with the students that one way of dealing with uh, the circular economy is to make it easy for all. And so he mentioned about recycling diapers by giving out coupons to parents and putting out place easy places where parents can deposit their dirty diapers or using um, 
better grade plastics so that there is an incentives for industry to uh, reuse uh, plastics, for example, in shampoo bottles. We have an advantage at WPI because we teach our students to apply technology to address social problems and environmental problems. But one characteristic of WPI is we uh, know how to learn, how to listen to people at the local community, thanks to our uh, uh, project centers throughout the world. We know how to listen and we know how to respect people's perspectives and cultures. This is very, very important because success at WPI means not only the outputs we produce, but the process by which we arrive at our conclusions. Next. And finally, I can't uh, end my talk with uh, talking about uh, uh, robotics. We, we know, for example, that in Rwanda, they're using drones to deliver medicine to remote places. But the big problem is what rules apply because uh, they've been trying to uh, use uh, civil aviation rules, but they don't apply because drones change every month. So um, uh, there is a beautiful challenge uh, for our faculty and our students in what kind of uh, order can we uh, place. Um, we know that robots eliminate jobs, but they also create jobs. That's why it's so nice that we have a degree in robotics engineering. And I'll end with this, a beautiful grand challenge. How can we create empathetic robots? Um, so thank you very much. And it is now my pleasure to introduce uh, Jean, who will take on our uh, questions. Thank you so much. Thank you. This was wonderful. I want to thank all my amazing colleagues for the informative and inspirational presentations. My only regret is I cannot take all their courses. <laughs> As the dean, they expect me to be doing something else. I literally would go to all their classes. I was just so impressed with everyone. I'm going, oh my God, I'd love to know this. So again, I'm Jean King and I'm facilitating the open session. Please type your questions in the Q&A box so we'll get to some of these questions afterwards. Right now, I'll go to our colleagues and sort of try to figure out if they could go a little deep on some of what they presented to us. So it is obvious that WPI approach focuses on the convergence of disciplines to address the complexities of the grand challenges facing us. Through the lens of STEM and social responsibility, which you heard in every single presentation, we aim to do that. Of course, social responsibility is most effective when it's linked to knowledge. So my first question will go to Professor Wobi. Professor Wobi, you gave the example of global health. Do you have other topics that you consider in the Great Problems Seminar? If so, what are they? Right now, I think we're gonna to go to a global view so we could see everyone. So if you're on your computer, go to full screen and the global view. So Professor Wobi, you're up. Thank you, Jean. Um, in fact, we do have other um, global grand challenges that are addressed. We have one class that deals with shelter and looks at particularly developing appropriate shelters for people who are dispossessed from migration or our disaster. We have a couple of classes that are looking specifically at climate change, one on energy, one on urban life. We are, have another one that's dealing with mass extinctions and what can be done to prevent or mitigate that and another on resource recovery. So many of the things that we heard here, we're asking our first year students to deal with from the first moment that they start classes with us. Which actually makes all the difference. So it's not something they learn on their way out, but it's something that they learn throughout their time with us here at WPI, which I think is one of the most important factors. It becomes a culture of what we do, right? Yes, yeah. and in that culture, it's really amazing. Professor Dimitri Korkin up next. I'd like to ask you, what do you feel WPI can do to make its biggest impact in terms of health, given what, given what we just saw in the pandemic? Well, I think uh, one of the, uh, thank you for the question, Jim. I think uh, one of the uh, greatest uh, strengths 
of WPI is the ability to uh, join disciplines, to become truly an interdisciplinary institution. So we, we should surely take advantage of this and we have taken advantage of this. Uh, and you know, on the personal, so more personal side, I think we also uh, have a great uh, way to deal with the data. And so, so this is where our strengths, this is where we're different from many other institutions that are fighting, um, you know, the global pandemic. And I think, uh, you know, by leveraging the data, integrating the data and doing it in an interdisciplinary fashion, uh, we can be, you know, we, we can stand out and, uh, you know, uh, be the leaders in, in this direction. Again, the convergence of what we do. I feel that WPI strength, and I think many of you brought this up, is that we work together well. We don't only teach our students how to work in teams. We work in teams. We collaborate across all these domains, making a multidisciplinary approach to all of what we do. So to Dimitri's point, we have data everywhere. And if we could collaborate on bringing this data together, it helps us to exemplify who we are and what we say we are in terms of social responsibility. So next up to Sarah, uh, where are you? Um, I know you're on here someplace. I haven't been able to see you. To Professor Sarah Strauss, what I'd like to ask you is, what other kinds of climate related research is in the works with faculty in the global school and across the campus? You referred to a few and I know there are many more. Could you put on your video please and respond? Huh. I hope we didn't lose Professor Strauss. Professor Strauss? Okay, I could come back. Okay, next I'll go to Professor Sarkis while we get to Professor Strauss. Professor Sarkis, yes, I see you on there. Are there other ways than some of the ways you mentioned that could be different disciplines getting together to study the circular economy other than what you mentioned? Oh, yes, I think there was many, many additional ones. For example, we were talking in our materials research group and some of the ones were at the biological level, believe it or not, at the very minute level of- um, My favorite topic. Yes, uh, <laughs> they were talking, and, and this is kind of interesting. I think it was, it was during the presentation uh, uh, last year, and they were talking about how these little uh, parasites or bacteria or microorganisms, I think is the official language that they use, were able to take um, these uh, cellulose out of wastewater to be able to reuse as paper products. This is a wastewater circular economy. There's many of these small examples that exist. Also, um, when you look at the general projects that students have been done, whether IQPs and our MQPs, a lot of them deal with recycling or byproduct development and so on that really relate to a lot of circular economy principles. Of course, I only stayed at some of the research things, but there's educational activities as well that are cross-disciplinary that are uh, occurring. No matter what department, biomedical engineering, um, chemical engineering, uh, business and of course the uh, the social aspects need to be covered in this as well. And I do know that there's been work in system dynamics related to a lot of the issues related to sustainability and these um, aspects of the closed loopedness. So it, it's all over the place. And these are just additional examples. And I just wanted to put those out there as well. Well, thank you. We appreciate that. And the biological piece, we have been talking about this a little bit, Professor Sarkis. I'm really excited to hear about how we could talk about the Krebs cycle and all of the things as biologists we think about as the circular economy within our bodies and within the earth. So thank you so much for mentioning that. And thank you. That theme around, you know, going from discipline to discipline. If we get back to the engineers for a minute and we say um, to Professor Hal Walker, what is the best way you think to train the next generation of engineers to think about and tackle the problems about global water? What are the challenges they face and how is the best way we could actually train them? Professor Walker. Sure, uh, so I think uh, the key is, is an integrative education, which happens to be exactly what uh, I think we're one of our strengths here at WPI. 
Um, as, as all the speakers highlighted, these grand challenges are really multidimensional. Um, and so thinking of it in just a single, a single register or single dimension is just not gonna make very much progress. Um, to implement an integrative education, again, we're really well positioned based on our background and expertise and, and just in our DNA of project-based learning. Project-based learning is uh, just such a wonderful tool, a wonderful way to, to bring together different perspectives and concepts in an integrative fashion and, and to see the students how, you know, they're just minds just click naturally around this kind of thing when, when we give them these uh, rich projects to work on. And then I just say the last thing, uh, the last piece of the puzzle here is, um, are the project centers and the global experiences. And, and certainly before uh, the pandemic, we were making really great strides for uh, you know, as many students as possible to have these global experiences. And so I'm sure we'll get back to that uh, in time. And so that's probably the, the other big piece of the puzzle. Thank you so much. So I'm getting back to Professor Strauss, who was um, kicked out on Zoom. Uh, Professor Sarah Strauss, what I asked was, what are the other kinds of research in the works with faculty in the global school and across campus in the camp in the like climate related realm? What are some of the other things that you didn't get a chance to talk about, or you would briefly like yeah. to mention? Yes, thank you, uh, Jean, for asking that. Uh, we have. Right now we have a group getting together. This is actually one of the most current uh, activities. We have a group getting together at the beginning of B term to discuss the ways that we can engage with what NSF is calling uh, sustainable systems networks. And this would, you know, you saw the uh, work going on in Worcester and in the surrounding area. Um, and we would like to be able to connect, for example, our uh, already existing project centers out with um, the, um, sustainable farming that we've got going up in Paxton, as well as the urban activities in the Worcester Center um, across campus in looking at ways that not just these individual communities or sectors can adapt to climate change, but how we can view, again, the word systems keeps coming up, right? As we can view this entire regional system in central and western Massachusetts with a hub in, West, in Worcester uh, to be able to connect how various different sectors from transportation and ag, right, to urban development, other kinds of things, water, uh, as we've already heard from multiple speakers today, um, connect in thinking forward, thinking our way forward as communities that are linked. Um, and so that's gonna be one very exciting initiative. And we will also be applying uh, for graduate training support, much like you saw the CEDARS program that was just awarded. We will be looking uh, to the NSF as well for support for the new community climate adaptation graduate program. So those are a couple of the things. Thank you so much. So um, I know we don't have a lot of time, so we'll try to go around. And Professor Paul Madison, could you tell us uh, a little bit about how WPI prepares our students for meeting the sustainability challenges of the future? Certainly. Um, thank you for the question. Then, so um, we have there. There are some some departments that focus a lot of fair amount on sustainability, which would include you know civil engineering, chemical engineering, as well as environmental and uh, sustainable studies. Um, and social studies in, in general. Um, and you know, but what I would probably add though is that there's a, a breadth of, of departments which all have different components and have different aspects in which they contribute. And so I don't wanna cut out departments when I think about it. Um, in terms of those departments, I would say that we're seeing increased amount of uh, sustainability being addressed within their programs. And that's one thing that we try to do to track it. We try to track to see how much we're doing. The other thing is we're trying to raise awareness about the, uh, um, say, the sustainable development goals and try to have greater awareness from the students. We're also seeing greater awareness from the students um, about how those can be incorporated into their programs and how they can advance uh, their, their efforts in that area. Um, you know, the other things I'll probably add too. There, there's a breadth of different programs, just as you look at the Great Problem Seminars are things that raise awareness and provide great background, since they're so focused on the grand challenges and sustainability, the grand challenges uh, uh, initiatives that we have here as well. And, and just the, the breadth of different things that are aspects of sustainability that are being brought into the different programs um, are really uh, providing an increased background. And I guess the final thing I add is, you know, these projects are, are just phenomenal. There's so many projects 
budgets that, that really bring in sustainability. Um, they, they really, um, the, to get that experience to be out there, either working with communities and to uh, really understand the full breadth of the problem. I think that's a huge experience and an ex excellent background for you know, moving forward and addressing some of these, these uh, grand challenges and sustainability issues in the future. Thank you, so. Professor Matheson. Yes, again, we talk about, you know, making sure that our students are ready for the future, not just ready for now. So thank you so much for saying that. Professor Liang, as we talk about your programs in China and everywhere else, I think we're asking how much language preparation do we need to either be a researcher or a student in these programs? You're muted. Could you start over? Thank you. Okay. Am I? Good. Thank you. That's a great question. Thank you for asking. Um, I think the beauty of the many opportunities that WPI provide uh, is that not only um, before we send the students to global sites for all those uh, wonderful uh, research and educational experience, not only we prepare them technically, we prepare them culturally, we prepare them with uh, sufficient language uh, background. If the language is indeed a barrier, we work with the uh, partner universities um, many of our project centers in Asia actually uh, follow this model. We work with partner universities to provide a kind of like a joint team with uh, local uh, graduate, uh, local undergraduate students and the mentors from the local universities to help us to uh, maneuver the cultural system as well as overcome the language barrier. So our students, not only they get all those wonderful experience of doing research, they have the opportunities to forge lifelong uh, friendships with the students at the partner universities, at the collaboration institutes. They grow together with all those wonderful minds, uh, young minds, and uh, you know engineers in growth. So um, I think that's an added benefit of providing uh, our students all those preparations and opportunities. I, I totally agree because some things are lost in translation and it's so wonderful that our students get an opportunity to understand another language. There's so much in culture that's rooted in language. So thank you so much for saying that. Absolutely. Professor Kruger, um, as we think about what are the employment tracks for our students? We are talking about social responsibility and people have this idea that it's about giving back to the world and there are no jobs. So why are our students doing this after spending so much money to come to WPI? Uh, thanks for the question, Jean. Um, so what we've been doing is uh, reaching out to firms um, with interest in this area. I've mentioned Crew Technologies. I've mentioned Intel. And what we're trying to do is, um, I'm looking at the, the list of folks or the, the images of people on the ribbon above me here. And, and, and like in engineering, you know, you get a, an internship in your sophomore year, you get a paid internship, in between your sophomore and junior year, you probably go back to work for that company again between your junior and senior year. And if you don't have a job offer on the table by sometime in the fall, you did something wrong. And we're working to create that same kind of pipeline with firms who are interested in doing the work that we're talking about, who share the values that we share about creating, you know, shared co-created value um, for communities and places. We have, we have, um, private sector partners in Ghana, Zimbabwe, and in Ethiopia, um, and Mozambique, who are all interested in, in, in working on these types of things. And then also creating these types of um, uh, educational platform, this educational platform with micro credits and micro degrees and things like that, that aren't just available to the people that uh, uh, are from this country, but are also available and, and useful and defined by people um, who are our global partners. Thank you. Thank you so much. So that really leads me into my last um, question for the panelists before we go on to your questions, uh, to panelist Professor Martin Burt. Martin, tell us a little bit about how WPI students could collaborate with global social entrepreneurs. Is that possible? It is very possible. Uh, in fact, we have been connecting um, so um, WPI future social entrepreneurs with social entrepreneurs working in the United States, in Europe, and Latin America, Africa, and Asia. 
Uh, it could be a social entrepreneur in Canada who invented a new way of teaching math. It could be a social entrepreneur working in the Silicon Valley uh, using rocket and missile technology to uh, allow the deaf to read and to talk. It could be social entrepreneurs um, uh, in India creating a um, telephone system that will allow uh, abandoned children to call for help. Or it could be um, so, uh, students right there at WPI mm -hmm. campus uh, using um, the poverty stoplight methodologies to understand poverty right there in the United States and talk with um, folks in Chicago, in um, New Orleans, in North Carolina, and work, for example, with the homeless in Brazil and the homeless in Los Angeles at the same time. So um, uh, I have been working with uh, WPI uh, professors and students in making the connection there. Many times there is no difference between social entrepreneurship and entrepreneurship. And working, for example, with uh, Professor Rob Traver uh, and uh, Professor Matheson about wetlands. <laughs> the wetlands, is that a social problem? Is that a sustainability problem? And so this global systemic approach really allows um, us to not have the disciplines of the third or the second industrial revolution. This is science. This is social. This is culture. No, that is a, a oversimplification. And now with the systems approach that we have, uh, there's room for everybody. In fact, the more um, people from different disciplines you have, the stronger you are. It's a, it's a living world. Thank you so much. This has been wonderful. Again, I need to take all your classes to feel as educated as I want to be. Thank you so much for everything you have said. Now we're gonna to go to open up some questions from our audience. Um, Carrie, could you help us by reading a question, please? Yes, I'm happy to. So here's one for Professor Strauss. How do you navigate the delicate balance of the spirituality of some sacred archeological sites during anthropological studies? Yes, and I was actually just Sorry, there I am. Uh, I was just typing an answer to that question because I wasn't sure if it was going to come up. That is a great question. Um, I'm not actually an archeologist. I, there's many different branches in anthropology and I'm a cultural anthropologist. So what I get to do is hang out and talk to people mostly and not actually dig up stuff. And uh, you know, at the same time, um, in all of our endeavors across all of the different research domains that we've been discussing, whether geography or anthropology or uh, humanities or geology, geochemistry, energy studies, the goal I think you have seen from all our presentations is to be able to collaborate with local communities and not to come in and impose things. And so um, I, I think that part of the way that we are addressing this is that what we do is ask uh, how we can work together rather than come in to say, this is what we're doing. And certainly my experience with colleagues who are archeologists, uh, that's mostly with folks in this country working with indigenous communities, um, they are always working collaboratively to do the kinds of things that can be, for example, helpful to the tribes. I, um, I was, this question reminded me of another uh, study that I know of in East Africa, uh, that was looking at uh, how GIS and really cool kinds of 3D modeling of um, landscapes could be used to, first of all, and this was initiated actually at the request of a, um, a community that was being denied its land tenure, its, its right to the land, they wanted help with this. And in the process of bringing in outside researchers to document that land tenure, they brought in youth and all kinds of things to uh, all kinds of different dimensions of the community to both 
document their land tenure claims, but also build the community in ways that had kind of drifted apart in, in the past. And so that modeling exercise that the researchers brought um, saved their land and also allowed them to rebuild communities. So there are many such examples of collaborative work. And I would say that in archaeology and anthropology, as, as these many other domains, we see that. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. the idea that respect um, is at the center of what we do is coming out over and over again. Thank you so much. Carrie, do we have another question, please? Yes, there's a question about the branding of the global school. Will it become WPI the global school or the global school part of WPI? So. Thank God we have the provost on here, provost <laughs> of Asia. Yeah. I, I think this is a very interesting question, right? I, I think right now, of course, we're launching the Global School at WPI. But it's clear that WPI is really embraced the whole notion of global internally. And we're reaching out across our partners externally to collaborate in a way that increases the footprint of what we bring. And so we hope that as we reach out across the world and we work with our partners across the world, this becomes the presence of WPI in the world. And, and it's, it's, it's really, for me, very exciting because essentially what we're sharing is our common values and our common capacity to co-create in ways that increase our footprint. And that's what I hope really we're launching today. Okay, Carrie, I think we could have one more question um, and then we need to wrap up. Yes, so we have a few more here. Uh, looks like there's one in reference to the sustainability group. Is large scale plastic recycling really possible? Looks like a big question. I'm not sure if we'll have enough time to answer it, but I thought I'd put it out there. Large scale plastic recycling. Who wants to take that? Just do hands up. Is that possible? Okay. Professor Sarkis. I, I saw the note there. And one of the things that was being stated was this was a essentially a conspiracy by some of the petroleum manufacturers that they're putting out the plastics with no intention at all of recycling them in the future, that they will undermine that. And they don't even care what happens to the plastics as it comes out. And they were putting out ads and advertisements essentially saying, oh, plastics are recycled. 99% of plastics are recycled. Um, that turned out to be not so true. Uh, as a matter of fact, a very small percentage of plastics are um, recycled. But it does not mean that we cannot recycle them. And I think there's multiple issues going on here. As we mentioned, it's a very complex issue. Some of the issues are technical, of course. You can have different types of plastics and how they're recycled and the amount of energy required, the amount of collection and how you design the system. Some of them are uh, behavioral. People have to know that the plastics that they're recycling will eventually be recycled so that they will recycle. When you get these types of stories, people don't trust the recycling system at all. And you lose this trust in society and its recycling systems because you hear things that, oh, plastics are being thrown out into the ocean. Another aspect, of course, is the business model is a reason, one way to incentivize. And we work, we are in an economic situation here and econo economy makes things go in a lot of, uh, a lot of places. If you incentivize appropriately and set up the infrastructure to do so, you can accomplish it. Now, of course, those who produce the plastics don't want to spend money in, in investing at the end of the life of the plastics. That needs to be done. It can be done in many different ways. There's also approaches right now to increase the amount of plastics recycling from incentive systems, new technologies, blockchain technologies, education. As a matter of fact, in my classes, we do two or three cases specifically related to plastics. Some of these cases show that industry is the leading, not necessarily the plastics and petroleum industry, like the computer industry is leading. We also did cases related to the types of blockchain technology to incentivize uh, people, maybe in developing countries related to the development, can help with the recycling of plastics. Um, can it be done? 
eventually maybe now if you want to look at a recycling system that's really effective uh, think about aluminum aluminum is one of the most efficient types of recycling as a matter of fact here's an interesting fact and i'll enter at this 75 percent of all the aluminum that's been mined is still being used somewhere in the world this is throughout the history of aluminum mining Okay, let's hope the plastic <laughs> well, comes up. Well, that's a great that point, and, and Professor Sarkis. Again, I cannot tell you enough how much this has been wonderful in terms not just about the informational pieces of it, but how inspiring it has been. Thank you so much. 